So we have whiteboards. Let's see what this does. There we go. I haven't tried the whiteboard feature out yet. I just saw it. Very cool. Different colors and everything. Remember Harold and the Purple Crown? Love those stories. Oh, <laughs> oh keep this here. Awesome. Ryan, I made your co host. Yep, thank you. Hey, y'all can see the whiteboard? Or not? Yep. You do? Okay. It's got a flicker to it, but that may be me. Okay. Share. It's share it. Oh, I can share. I can, I guess, email it to somebody. Well, that's kind of cool. Okay. So, what? Alan Buck. Hi, Christopher. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Recovering from COVID. Yes. I had it about three weeks ago, but I'm fine now. Good. Well, you are no longer with the Isle of Man, as I understand. You moved somewhere else. No, I've now moved to the United Kingdom. Oh. <laughs> So we are, we are united once again. All right. Well, I, I miss being able to say that you are the manliest man for the manliest island. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Morning, Brother Keith. Hello. How are you, sir? Fine. Nice bright yellow shirt. I like that. No, thank you. I, I, actually, Keith had just finished doing his um, his uh, his um, um highway cleanup uh he's on the road crew <laughs> and he just stopped <laughs> yeah. in for a few minutes <laughs> that's it that's right well you know work release is a good thing we, we like having you back so. i've enjoyed it <laughs> let's see brother yanetti welcome to you sir see new faces here that's cool or at least new screen names anyway maybe not faces yet and brother delucia delucia Delucia. I'm terrible with names. Uh, De Lucia, but thank you. It's nice Delucia. to see you all. Good to have you. Thank you. All right. And Michael says hello. I'll put the chat over here on the other screen. So I wanted to share with you. I guess most of you all are on Facebook, um, but uh, I did get a very nice award from our, I think it was our district deputy grandmaster put me in for it, but um, hang on. This, and this, I want to at least show it. Came in a nice little package. But this is a certificate of merit from the Grand Lodge, and it was on behalf, of, I think, our district deputy. I don't know if the members of the lodge had anything to do with it, or if the district deputy put it together. Keith might know. But it's a very nice certificate of merit signed by the Grand Master last year, and our new district deputy brought it and presented it to me at our last meeting last Saturday. Keith, did you know anything about that? No, I didn't. And I guess if it were the lodge, it would have it would have come through me, I would think. Right. The secretary. Right. So it was probably the district deputy did it alone. But yeah. again, congratulations on receiving that award. Thank you. Thank you. It was very it was very nice. Well, what's funny is um we um at the annual, uh, Fred Dixon, who's a member of my lodge and Scottish Rite and everything, he's a member of a group called the York Rite College, I think it is, and they gave me their gold award, and he brought it to the research lodge meeting to give it to me, and that was really neat to get that, and then I missed the February meeting, and then I go to the main meeting, and I get another award, so I don't know what it is, but every time I go to research lodge, somebody's handing me an award, so that's kind of cool. I just... <laughs> But it was nice to be recognized. And I, it actually means more to me receiving it in Research Lodge because that's where all the work I've been doing is really for, more so than my own lodge. And I haven't been to my own lodge as much as I'd like, but it was it was it meant more to me receiving it at Research Lodge because that's where all the, the effort was for primarily was further in research. But it, it's, it's really nice to be recognized. Man, I don't do this stuff for awards or anything, but it's really kind of cool when you get something. <laughs> so... It was very nice. Uh, let's see. Uh, Brother Newberger, good to have you with us. If you want to unmute and say hello. Hi, good to be here from uh, New Jersey. Thank you. Oh, very good. And Brother Rourke, 
You are. I think we're trying to set you up as a speaker. Are we not, Brother Rourke? Rourke, Rourke I'm butchering your name. I'm sorry. Yeah, what one of these days? Yeah, I've been just busy. Oh, yeah, Got a million kids in, around the house, so I'm trying sorry. to find a free weekend is hard. How do you say your last name? Rue Ark, like kangaroos on the ark. Okay, Rue Ark. Okay, yes. Thanks. We we talk, I remember your name. We talked a few times in the past, and hopefully we'll get you in as a speaker. Yeah, I look forward to it. And Brother Ted driving a Jeep. Awesome. Good to have you here, Brother Ted, if you want to say hello. Ted B. Hey, how's it going? Very good. And let's see, Freighter, uh, well, Brother Freighter, I know that's not, that's the title. Well, who is it? Go ahead and say your name. Tell us who you are, where you're from. Hi, I'm, I'm Roy Bradburn. Hi, everybody. Oh, oh, our speaker. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah, I, I tried to change the, uh, the screen name, but, you know, unfortunately, my computer had other ideas. So this okay. is kind of where we're at. <laughs> well, if now that you're in the Zoom, if you just hover over your picture and hit the three dots, you can hit rename. Ah. So it's easier to do it from within once you're actually in a meeting. Ah, there we go. Yep. I, I've joined yes, a few uh, meetings, as, as a few business meetings at Isaac's dad. And like, hey, Isaac's dad. <laughs> oh, Romeo came back. So most of the time I, I just leave my name. So I don't have to All right, there he is, our speaker. Well, good. Glad you're here. And he has a, a world of information right behind him there. So <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. Oh. Okay, I managed to unmute. There you are, Brother Romeo. You had to leave and come back. Good to have you with us. Where are you held? Uh, I was trying to work out how to unmute, and I had to go into settings and all sorts of things. Yeah, worship Brother Romeo from Ballarat, Victoria, Australia. Oh, Australia. That's awesome. Good to have you with us. Mm -hmm. Uh, brother Ade, another one of our frequent flyers. Good to have you with us, brother. Hi, good to be here again. Hope you're all doing great. Good to have you with us. All right. We've got a good crowd coming out. Are we at, yeah, we're just after 10 o'clock. All right. I'll let a few more people come in. Uh, there was something else I was going to mention, and it will come to me in a minute. But, you know, I'll, it's good to have all of you here. Well, that's what I meant to do. Let me bring up my sticky notes. Ready. Um, oh, that's not the one I wanted, though. Notes. I'd like to welcome everyone to Virginia Research Lodge's unstated meeting. Uh, my name is Chris Douglas. I'm your host. In the chat, I am putting in some uh, <coughs> links for y'all. I'm going to go ahead and mute a few of y'all because you got chatter in the background. If you need to speak, please go ahead and just unmute. Um, all right. So in our um, in the chat, you can see our Facebook page, which is where most of our business takes place. You can find our research papers there. Um, we have close to 2,000 members on our research, our Facebook page, and we have about 1,700, I think, on the email list every week. So you're welcome to sign up for the emails, get our research papers. Um, next is our Lodge website where we have all of our papers that have been published, as well as the other fun things I've built over the years. Um, one of them, I've built a, um, a search engine of listing all of the Grand Lodges and Supreme Councils throughout the world. I think I have all of them and their websites. I was working on an Amity program of who recognizes whom and I got somewhere in the bees around Brazil and there's about 15 Brazilian lodges. So I kind of got lost. So I <laughs> stopped filling it up. So you can't trust the Amity as being complete. But if I do say this Grand Lodge recognizes that Grand Lodge, then that's accurate. But if you don't see something, it doesn't mean that they don't. It's just that I hadn't got that far in building out. If you got 200 unique things and you're trying to tie them to 200 other unique things, it, it takes a lot of time and I haven't really invested the time to keep plugging away at that. Um, but there's other fun stuff on our website. Uh, then our YouTube channel, that is where all of these unstated meetings are hosted. I finally posted the one from three weeks ago uh, on the uh, secrecy. That one's up there now. And then my email address, if you're not on Facebook, you can always email me to be added to our mailing list. 
Um, it's good to see you all here. I think I said hello to everybody who came in. Um, I do have an announcement. I've bought a new laptop. It's one of those new two-in-ones that folds over. So it's like, it's a laptop and then you can fold it on itself and it's a tablet and it's got a, a stylus and it also stands up like an easel so you can like watch a movie or something. I needed a new laptop that's a little more powerful that I can use to work with and just be sitting outside or on my couch or whatever. And I don't want, I, like, I don't like doing anything on my phone other than like maybe like Facebook or texting. It's too small to see, but I needed something that I can walk around the house and use. And I'm going to try once it comes in to sit outside and set up a camera and see if I can host this meeting outside. That way I can have a cigar while we're having our morning meeting. So I just want to be able to do different things with it. And I needed something more mobile and my iPad had finally died. I mean, it really wasn't that efficient. It was kind of small and it's, it's Apple, not windows. And I'm a windows guy. So, so I'm investing in getting myself a more useful to toy to play with. And that was going to be a Christmas present. And then, shipping took forever and it's like okay i'll check later and now it's like may and it's like okay you, you promised to buy yourself something a while ago <laughs> get off the stick and go ahead and order it so i'm happy with that so that if you see me with my glasses all tinted in a different background it means i'm sitting outside so and smoking a cigar since i can't do that in the house <laughs> so want to welcome anyone every if anyone has anyone to say hello greeting anything before we go to our speaker I just want to give anyone an opportunity if they wanted to chime in. Okay. Everybody's perfectly happy. Good. Good to hear it. It is good to see Brother Buck back. He hasn't been with us for a while. I like seeing our regular attendees coming back. That's pretty cool. So, okay. I did have one question I want to pose to the group. If anyone wants to answer, I don't know if I'll go around or just let you all speak up if you like. Something that just occurred to me right before we started here, I was thinking – when I was shaving about um, things that, okay, here's the question, I'm trying to formulate this. Is there something that you find you are naturally good at that you used to always assumed, like growing up, whatever, that everybody else was automatically good at, and then you figured out that, no, that's a talent you had, and you sort of assumed everyone else thought this way or everyone else could do this, and you found that, no, you're kind of rare. Like, for me, I'm good at, analyzing maybe over analyzing things i found it's useful in my job i can go look at like a complex thing i can read up on something and, and see all the different elements and i can kind of piece them together in my head and see it as a complete system and then i can explain that to somebody else and i find a lot of people aren't able to do that so i'll just open this up any of you want to chime in something you found that you're good at that you just assumed at first that like everybody's really good at it. riding a bike whatever well that's anybody can ride a bike Anyone care to chime in? I think uh, for me, um, I think for me it was uh, speaking like in front okay. of people. Right. I, I just, you know, for me, I was, I was never really that shy kid in school or anything. So for me, you know, to get up and speak in front of people, it's always been kind of, I mean, I don't really get that nervous tick that a lot of people get. And so I just always assumed that that was just, how things were for everybody and then i was kind of shocked when i found out that no that's not the way it is for a lot of people exactly so. exactly so what do you mean you don't like to speak very good good example yeah. brother roy anyone else anyone okay clearly no one else is good at public speaking go ahead paul <laughs> i've got a high mechanical aptitude yes and uh Abstract reasoning. I tested uh, my sophomore year of high school. Okay. So, um, and that's um, that relates to being able to visualize stuff uh, in your head and put things together as a as a visual, uh, for lack of anything else, not necessarily an image, but visually yes. construct something in your brain. And so, uh, for a number of years, I was doing uh, computer support over the phone. And uh, that served me well. When I got out of college, I was uh, doing field service for, back then it was Burroughs Corporation. Uh, and uh, working uh, a lot of uh, bank equipment. And uh, on more than one occasion, occasionally someone at the teller window would look over at me and say, how do you know where to put everything back? 
<laughs> exactly. Good example. Because these, these were the days of uh, printing terminals. Oh, had, right. Remember when they had to pass books? For, uh, anybody remember the oh, yeah. pass books for savings accounts? Oh, yeah. yes. Uh, these machines were uh, had a split platen that would uh, print your uh, receipt or your passbook, and then had a ledger on the other side. Yep, I remember. I had a I had a, a savings account at it was University Federal Savings, and I got out of the Marines, came back home, and I still had eight dollars and three cents in my savings account that I had for like ten years. <laughs> I had it touched. I was like, woohoo, eight bucks, woohoo! Yeah, I remember passbooks. That was a long time ago. Anybody else have a similar thing? I just think it's fascinating because like we all live in our own heads, right? And the more you talk and interact with other people, people don't always ask obvious questions. You know, I mean, that, that's the old joke about, you know, is, is the color red? When I see red, do you see red? Or do you see what I would call blue? And it's really hard. It's like, how do you pin that down? It's like, well, that's red, that's blue. I, you might see what I see, I, you know, as red is blue and blue is red, but you don't know. But I just think everybody, it's like until you bother to bring it up to someone, it's like, yeah, you know, I'm, you just assume everybody's good at it. You know, I, I'm good at balancing. I'm very good at balancing. I can walk on the edge of a curb or something and I fall. I'm, I'm, I have naturally good balance. You assume everybody is that way. You assume everybody's brain works the way yours does until you talk to other people and then you find out that, that that's not true. I just find that fascinating. That's, it does, you don't bring it up because you just figure, well, everybody's this way. So anyone else want to offer a similar skill? It's okay. <laughs> all right. I just try to bring up different things here and just kind of get us all chatting with each other. Just ideas that come in my head. I don't know. So I'm going to go and introduce our speaker today, Brother Roy Bradburn, and I'll leave it up to him to give his, um, um, his, uh, uh, um, um, yeah, man. His own biography. Tell us who he is, where he's from, and uh, he can get into his talk. As soon as you unmute. Okay. One, one of these days, I'm going to let the speaker. I'm going to let the speaker talk on mute for like ten minutes, and then say, "I'm really sorry." <laughs> and and I guarantee. <laughs> I, I guarantee you it'll take me at least 20 minutes to figure out that I'm muted. So right. actually, no, what'd be funnier is I'd let you talk for like 10 minutes and, and everybody hears you, you know, and you're not muted and just stop. You're just like, I am so sorry. I just realized that you've been on mute this whole time. I need you to start over. And oh, just that, that would be, that would be fantastic. Like I said, <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Hey. And you have a, I'm sorry, I meant to ask, do you, do you need to share? Do you have a, a presentation? Yeah, I, I do have a couple of uh, pictures that I'll need okay. to share with everybody. I while going added you there. Okay, cool. Okay, let's start again. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Brother Roy Bradburn is our speaker. He'll go ahead and introduce himself. Cool. All right. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Roy Bradburn. I'm actually a Mason here in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, I have been a Mason for about 15 years. I am a Scottish Rite Mason. I am a Royal Arch Mason. I am junior warden at my lodge, the uh, Florence Lodge, uh, number 281 ancient free and accepted Masons here in Omaha. I'm also a dual member with Mercer Lodge here in Omaha. Um, I'm a member of the Grand College of Rites. I'm a member of SRICF. Uh, a member of Quattro Coronati Correspondence Circle. I'm on education committees. So, um, so yeah. So uh, I'm very, um, very active in in, in masonry. Um, something that I've been spearheading and and part of what brings me here today is in the Blue Lodge. We often discuss. Uh, we we give our our new candidates a lot of information. And we give them a lot of symbols, but we don't necessarily explain the background of a lot of those symbols. So as education chair at my lodge this year, I've been focusing on the entered apprentice degree and giving our new entered apprentices uh, background into why we do things the way we do with them. Uh, part of that got me thinking about uh, 
you know, we hear a lot about the Kabbalah and the hidden meanings of, of the mysteries in our Blue Lodges, but we don't touch on them a lot, as I mentioned. One of those is the Kabbalah. We hear a little bit about it uh, when we do our own research in the Blue Lodge, but we don't discuss it very much. So today, what I'd like to do is kind of venture into the hidden Kabbalah and its meaning within the officers of the Blue Lodge setting. Um, is everybody here a little bit familiar with uh, with the Kabbalah? No. Nope, nope. No? Okay, so um, we're going to get into the, I know for Scottish Rite it gets mentioned, but yes. that's about it. Yes, and yeah, I mean, there again, you know, we, we hear about it in those degrees, but there's not a lot that's really discussed about it or, or given. Um, let's see. Bear with me here just a moment. All right. So oh, on your screen, you'll see this, this glyph. Uh, this is going to play in pretty heavily to what we are talking about today. The Kabbalah is an ancient form of Jewish mysticism. And basically what it discusses is how we get closer to God. And the way we do that is we, we go through these dis different spheres, is what they're known as, or sephra, and by gradually uh, becoming more attuned to these different sephra and their meaning, we ultimately become closer to God and understanding of God. So I'm going to go ahead and start. And uh, like I say, we'll be going through this, this what's known as a glyph or symbol as we go along. And you will see how each of our officers and everything in the Blue Lodge corresponds to different aspects of this. And I will explain that. So the purpose of this lecture is not to unlock every mystery of the Kabbalah or every mystery in association with our illustrious fraternity. No, uh, brethren, the purpose of this short uh, treatise is for one very important reason, uh, and that is to cause you to see and, or to uh, basically seek and knock for the truth contained within the lecture I present to you today. I hope that what I present today helps us, helps you all to look more deeply into our Blue Lodge and her rituals so that you, my brethren, may gain your own truths and understanding that you and all of us may, uh, may strive uh, to those higher and loftier goals of making ourselves better stones to fit in that lodge, not made with human hands, eternal in the heavens. In this lecture, I'm going to be presenting you with the Kabbalistic symbolism of each of the officers of the lodge and their course, correlation along the Sephirotic spheres of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. So with that, let us go ahead and get started. So, what is the Kabbalah anyway? Uh, this question comes up a lot within Freemasonry, especially amongst, us breth or amongst new brethren and amongst our more non-esoteric brethren. When the question has been asked, many brethren simply tell the querent a generic answer such as, it is Jewish mysticism. Or when I asked, and this was my favorite response I was ever told uh, back when I first joined Freemasonry, I was told, it's a form of mumbo jumbo that is only symbolic allegory and really you won't need to know much about it. Well, my brother and I can tell you this much, uh, over the years, I have found out that it has become far more important in masonry than what I once thought it did. Neither of these answers are satisfactory, as masonry is a form of hermeticism and discusses and symbol symbolizes both Kabbalistic views along with alchemical mysticism as well. Uh, when you study alchemy and some of the origins of our rituals, you'll find that it goes hand in hand with, Kabbal with Kabbalism and also goes hand in hand with that alchemical study. Um, so it, it, it is vitally important. Um, basically, Kabbalah is based on two uh, old scriptures or old books from Jewish mysticism. The first, of course, of these uh, Jewish works is the Talmud, which is also called the Book of Splendors, and the Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of uh, Formation. 
Within these two ancient Hebrew texts, we learn of how to slowly purify ourselves to better make enable us to become as God or become as one with God. In these texts, we learn what is known as the three pillars and the tree of life. The three pillars are the guides and they enable us to control our actions and gradually be, bring our minds to peace and humility. The tree of life is a complex glyph or symbol as pictured here on the screen. And it represents the human condition and also represents the paths one must take or try to take in order that one can bring his mind, body, and soul back into balance with God. As I'll explain, these two symbols are heavily portrayed within our Blue Lodge, her officers and her rituals. If we look at the Masonic ritual, we will see that a man must first be prepared in his heart to be made a Mason. This follows almost identical to what one must do to start the journey to God on the, Kab on the Kabbalistic tree of life. To become more like unto God, one must learn to prepare oneself in his heart, and only by doing this can one set their mind to do the work that is required to achieve balance within the divine, which in our Masonic rituals we symbolize and inculcate this very statement over and over again to both our candidate and ourselves. So the very first, uh, the very first thing we're going to discuss is the ten yes, uh, sephira and finding them in the Blue Lodge. So to explain the Kabbalistic connotations of the Blue Lodge and her officers in regards to the in regard to the Kabbalistic tree of life, we must take a look at the symbol itself, which is pictured on the screen. Upon it, you will notice that there are ten circles or spheres. These circles are the ten sephira and represent certain points of the human spirit and certain planetary and spiritual influences that cause us to be more or less balanced on any given day in regards to certain situations. To explain this more, let us start to break down each sephira by each particular presence in the lodge. So the very first place we're going to start, my brethren, is down here. This, this one, if you look where my pointer is, this is the very, it's the 10th Sephra, but it's the very first starting point. And this is known as Malkut. The first Sephra we're going to examine is that of Malkut. On the tree, you will see it numbered as the 10th sphere and is located at the very bottom of the glyph. Within the Blue Lodge, this Sephra is represented by the rough ashlar, which, uh, which is still unhewn by the temple workmen and therefore unaware of its true of its true purpose and still half buried in the dark by this one can easily see that the new candidate in the ea degree is a perfect representation of malkuth he has been blindly led to the lodge caused a knock and been guided through the door but as of yet he has not fully became aware of how or where he is to be fitted he is still that unhewn stone lying darkened within the quarry. Now, of course, he alone is not the only person to be found in the sphere of Malkuth in our lodges. Malkuth is also represented by the Tyler, as he alone is the one that prepares the candidate and leads the candidate to the door and caused a knock to gain admittance. The Tyler is the workman of the earth that literally and symbolically is bringing rough stone out of the quarry, the candidate, preparing it to be brought to the temple, the preparatory and necessary questions, and finally presenting it to the lowest of the workmen in the temple, the stewards, so that they may inspect it and begin to hew the stone. In Kabbalah, Malkut means kingdom. And, of course, this meaning again, we see both the candidate and the Tyler represented. After all, a candidate is seeking admittance to the lodge, i.e. the kingdom of wisdom and light. And the Tyler guards the gates of wisdom from those who dwell in the darkness. Only by his allowance through the worshipful master to knock upon the door is the candidate ever allowed to enter and travail the paths to light. This brings us to our next sphere, which is here. This is Yesod, the ninth sphere. The next sephira on the tree or glyph we come to is Yesod, the sephiroth of, of foundation. 
When the new candidate is admitted to the lodge at the order of the Worshipful Master in the East, he finds himself under control of the junior and senior stewards, grasping him from either side and guiding him blind and bound to the senior deacon, who upon receiving him in due and ancient form, gives to him his first foundational teachings of Freemasonry. In this way, the senior deacon represents Yassad as the foundation Sephra upon the Kabbalistic journey of the candidate. This now brings us to the seventh and eighth, the pair here, which is Neshach and Hod. The next two Sephra that the candidate encounters along the path on the tree is represented by the two officers that escorted him to the senior deacon of Yassad. In the first place, which of course are the senior and junior stewards. Neshach, represented by the junior steward, represents continuing cycles, which of course stands to reason since if we look at the junior steward, his place is that of, of starting progression in the line of officers of the lodge. The senior steward represents Hode, which is a representation of glory, splendor, or respectiveness. When we look at the ritual of the lodge, this makes perfect sense that the stewards would be the physical representations of these two sephra. After all, when the worshipful master first addresses the stewards, he tells them to see that the candidate is properly prepared. It is literally by them that the candidate first is prepared for his new or continuing cycle on his journey to light. And it is also by the stewards he is prepared to receive the glory and splendor of the lodge based upon his responsiveness to their instructions. The candidate also represents both of these sephra himself. For if the candidate does not have the drive or desire of Neshach to continue the journey, then he will not receive the glory and splendor contained within the Masonic sphere of Hod. This now brings us to our sixth sphere, which is Tefret. Next, the candidate is confronted by the sphere of Tefret, the Sephra of beauty and truth. Tefret is central is a is the central Sephra on the Kabbalistic tree and is represented by the inner apprentice's counterpart, the junior warden. As we know from the Masonic ritual, the junior warden represents the pillar of beauty and in the Kabbalah is one of the three pillars on which the Sephirotic spheres are placed. The beauty of the junior warden's station is that he is the first of the chief officers of the lodge that the blindfolded candidate meets in the ritual. As the, as the journey of, the, of masonry continues for the initiate through the three craft or blue lodge degrees, the lessons of the junior warden becomes more and more self-evident in the progression of the new mason's journey from darkness to light. The beauty of Tufret is inculcated by the balance of the junior warden in, the, in that he is the balance of both. The balance of both, sorry, the pillar of wisdom of the worshipful master and the pillar of strength of the senior warden. A man that relies solely on the wisdom of the mind without the balance of strength and fortitude is found lacking. For wisdom without strength is foolishness, and strength without wisdom is madness. But when the two are brought to the balance of Tifereth and work in harmony within its framework, then a man's truth is found. The junior warden is also the perfect representation of Tifereth, as only through the balance of the beauty of truth can a mason ever hope to achieve to become not only worshipful master of his lodge, but also the perfect ashlar fitted into the lodge not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This brings us, our brethren, to Gevura, or Gevura, which is the fifth sephra. The candidate is confronted by the sphere of Gevura, which represents strength, judgment, law, and power. This is, of course, perfectly represented by the senior warden in the West. Within Freemasonry and other hermetic societies, this is the realm of the second of the three pillars that support the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, known as the Black Pillar of Severity. This pillar in Freemasonry 
is represented by the pillar of the celestial spheres. Whereas the candidate when brought before the junior warden in the south by the senior deacon is grant is greeted with warm with warmth and welcome when he is greeted in the west he is instead greeted with judgment and seriousness as the senior warden addresses the new candidate he conveys the seriousness of what the candidate is undertaking to become a freemason this point is driven home more and more to the candidate as he progresses through the degrees of the lodge. As the candidate learns in the third degree, strength unbalanced by wisdom and truth degrade and destroy the beauty of one's heart. And so too it is if in our own life we neglect to balance Gavura and Tiferet as we journey along the Kabbalistic tree. When one is too severe in his thought, Due to his own indulging of Gevura, one's mind becomes too restricted and one cannot truly contemplate, let alone practice, what is needed to be a good man or mason. This brings us, of course, to the fourth of the spheres, which is Hesed. The next sphere along the new candidate's journey is that of Hesed, which represents kindness and unlimited benevolence. This is represented by the worshipful master who causes the candidate to kneel and attend prayer. The worshipful master, uh, this is done by the worshipful master, to show that even when the world is dragging one down to the lowest depths of hell, one can always find respite in the overflowing benevolence and kindness found by attending counsel with the most high God of one's heart. By this simple act that the worshipful master instills the candidate to perform, he shows the candidate the greatest wisdom and kindness he can afford. By this act, the candidate begins to understand the immense power of Hesed when in alignment in his life. The true Mason in balance with, this, with his Sephirah will at all times seek kindness and benevolence from his creator and then exude the same to others. This brings us, my brethren, to what is known as Doth. Doth is brought before, or the candidate is brought before Doth, which technically is not a sephira, but rather is a point of confluence between wisdom and understanding. This is represented to the candidate and within our lodges by the book of the law and the compasses resting thereon, along with the three lesser lights of the lodge. It is conveyed to the candidate as he kneels in front of the altar and is brought to light by the master of the lodge. This understanding, all masons must pass in order to be raised a master mason. It is that invisible barrier that separates a man from being a master mason. It is the trestle board upon which is transcribed the book of life by the grand architect of the universe, whom during our rituals, the worshipful master conveys the knowledge thereof to the candidate and the rest of the brethren. So brethren, uh, Doth is kind of interesting. It actually represents a gateway. So if we look at the Master Mason degree, of course, we know that, that our candidate is brought low and then passes through a gateway represented by death and then brought to the knowledge of a Master Mason, or at least that's what we try to convey to the candidate. So Doth is kind of an awakening sphere. It, it, it's the first time, if you will, that the candidate is truly introduced to a divine type of nature. Now he's done this, of course, because through the benevolence of the worshipful master in the East, who is acting in, in the stead of the wisdom of, of God, actually raises the, the, uh, the candidate from his lying horizontal to the perpendicular of rectitude and therefore becomes a master mason. This, of course, once we pass through this, this area, we then come to the last three spheres, also known as the first three spheres, spheres rather, because when we pass through that, through the Master Mason degree, you know, what is the thing that we always tell our candidates? Just because you're a Master Mason doesn't mean that you get to stop. There's more to learn. Doesn't mean that they have to go into an appendant body by any means. 
but it's only at that point that the that the candidate truly understands or starts to understand the true gravity of what it means to be a mason and gets to learn the inner secret so is really in a lot of ways his knowledge is just beginning this brings us to the third of the spheres which is bina after passing the hidden veil of doth the candidate now finds himself in the presence of the three great lights and the three lesser lights and the representative representation by the three chief officers of the lodge the first of these he comes to is bina which is the sephirotic sphere of understanding and is represented by the junior warden. Bina's means of understanding is that it allows one to separate and understand the complex, co complex concepts of oneness with the divine and the concepts contained in our beautiful ceremonies and allegorical symbols and ideas one can understand intimately. The beauty that the junior warden represents and conveys as Bina to the candidate is that through all men are though all men are separate, we are all unified by brotherly love and thereby are unified within the grand architect of the universe's plan written upon his trestle board. Through Bina, the candidate learns and understands the wherefore and why he should model his own trestle board in life to that of the grand, ar grand architect's own. The junior warden represents Bina as the sun in the sky at high noon is the beauty and glory of the day. For at noon in the quarry, the masons of old began to see the beauty of the work they had accomplished in the day. Bina, like the junior warden, reminds us to keep watch, that we keep true to the divine plan, and that if we fail, we call ourselves back in due season, that we may continue perfecting our own ashlars as masons we are char charged to do. So the junior warden as Bina is, is a constant reminder to us to ever look higher, right? I mean, even within the, the lodge itself, if we look at the three chief officers of the lodge, which of course are the junior warden, senior warden, and worshipful master, we're reminded that not only do they represent the three strengths or three pillars of our, of our lodge, but they also represent the progressive steps of our candidate. Obviously, the junior warden represents the lowest or the less of the three chief officers. And just in that same due form, the candidate as the neophyte represents the lowest path of Freemasonry or the, the newest member of Freemasonry, hence why we sit them in the northeast corner of the lodge. We even tell them that during the entered apprentice degree. This, of course, means that the second pillar, of course, or the second highest of the ranking officers represents what? The fellow craft because he's that midway point, right? It's the midway from neophyte to, worship, to master mason. Obviously, the worshipful master represents the master mason or the third degree. And, and we see that especially within the ritual because at that point, the worshipful master, even though he's had a lot to say and, and does a lot in the, in the rituals of the inner apprentice and the fellow craft, in the master degree, he truly shows his true power or what he truly represents, as we've mentioned before. This brings us to the second of the spheres, which is known as Hokma. Now, as a candidate, we find ourselves squarely in front of the senior warden in the West, representing the second of the three great lights and the three lesser lights, the Sephirotic sphere of Hokma. The Sephira represents the wisdom of the superior mind or oneness with everything. This is represented by the senior warden because the knowledge and wisdom contained and expounded by the master of the lodge is passed to the senior warden in his absence. Likewise, the senior warden who represents the close of the day and moon of the night sees all the work of the quarry done and the edifice that has been created from the rubble chiseled away and fitted together. It is by his judgment that a candidate is allowed to finally pass to the East and learn the greatest of secrets that masonry has to offer. The senior warden as Hokma instills the candidate to discern his truth and understanding that he may live with constant improvement to be fitted into the temple not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So if we look at the ritual, 
the senior warden acts as almost the uh, when we look at the quarry anyway, and 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 uh, in in the Masonic line of uh, of allegory, the work is brought before first the junior warden, and then before the senior warden, before it's finally presented to King Solomon in the East to decide if it if it works for his temple, right? And that's kind of what the what the uh, senior warden represents. As Hokma, he has to be that discerning factor. He has to speak for the worshipful master, because if we look at the at the story of King Solomon's temple in the Bible and in the Talmud and in these various uh, holy scriptures, we find that if the the work was not accomplished to King Solomon's liking, and it had passed by the the junior or the junior warden and then the senior warden especially. There was a very good chance that he would not only get reprimanded, but quite possibly put to death if King Solomon was not, because he was working a divine work. King Solomon was quite the taskmaster, so to speak, and failure on anyone's part was not was not an option. And we do read in the Talmud and in various Jewish scriptures of King Solomon's wrath if if those stones were not perfect. So it stands to reason that the senior warden in the West, as Hokma, would have to look at it with a very keen eye and make sure that it was perfect to fit in that Holy of Holies, lest he face his own mortality at the hands of the worshipful master or King Solomon. So finally, we come to the very first sphere, the highest sphere. This is Keter or the crown. Finally, at long last, the candidate comes to the crowning glory of Keter in his Masonic journey. Keter is the Sephirotic sphere of the divine will of the Creator, and is, of course, represented by the worshipful master in the East. The crown of Keter en encompasses and contains all the other Sephira of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, just as the head of the human body controls and contains the secrets to move that body it sits upon. Kether is represented as the worshipful master not because he is the divine will, but rather because, as we say in our Blue Lodge rituals, he has the will wisdom to contrive the divine plans upon the master's trestle board. He, of course, gains this wisdom from the grand architect of the universe through the study of the Book of the Law, and all of the grand architect of the universe's knowledge, which is contained therein. In truth, no man or mason can ever hope to fully understand or comprehend the mysteries of the Sephirotic sphere of Keter, as to do so would be to understand all and every mystery of our Creator, which no man or mason can do any more than an insect can comprehend the inner mind of a human. Keter represents that perfect Ashlar, which, as a mason, we must have the wisdom to understand, is never perfected by any mason until his tools drop from his nerveless hands, and he is welcomed by his creator at the last. Kether teaches us in our Masonic rituals that no man is perfect, and through, and though that is true, we as Masons must strive to better ourselves, and by that action may we be at least not so much a rough stone as at that fateful day that the grand architect of the universe finds no means to enable us to fit within his divine and sacred edifice in the heavens. So, when we're talking about the worshipful master in the East as Kether, we're reminding ourselves constantly that though the master of the lodge uh, governs the lodge, and thereby governs the work, he himself is still working on himself. If we look at the worshipful master in the East, we notice something very striking, and that's that he sits, at least in, in Nebraska work, and I'm, I'm sure it's probably this way in, in most lodges. Um, but in, in Nebraska work, he sits squarely between the rough and the perfect ashlar. He's in that middle ground. And so he's working on himself even as we're working on ourselves. In fact, in, uh, in uh, our blue lodges here in Nebraska, 
we find that uh, we even wear our aprons constantly as fellow crafts uh, with the bib turned down. Uh, we never wear them with the property of the master of the lodge. And a lot of people get confused by that. And uh, we had a grandmaster that explained very succinctly, it's because we're constantly working in the quarries. The only time that we get to stop is when we die and we go up to that lodge on high. Then we're, then we're qualified to wear the master mason's apron. But until then, we, uh, we in Nebraska work, uh, we wear our apron, you know, just with the bib turned down as 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 fellow crafts so um that brings us to the last part of this lecture and give me just a moment and i'm going to pull up um attempt to pull up uh, let's see okay now i'm going to bring up this last uh picture here and oops, i can get my computer to work here okay there we go Okay, let's see, there we go. Okay, so now what you're going to see is, uh, everybody should be able to see this, but we have the tree of life that we just discussed, and then we have these three pillars, okay? And they are known as the pillar of balance, the pillar of mercy, and the pillar of severity, okay? So if we look at this, um, this glyph, uh, we're going to be talking about these three pillars now just briefly. And then we're going to open it up for questions because I'm sure that there's a lot of questions that people may have. So the three pillars. Now, my brethren, you have heard uh, how the officers are situated upon the spheres of the Kabbalistic tree of life. And you have even heard me explain how the candidate is integral to the path along the tree. But yet there is still more hidden upon the lodge's uh, trestle board if we but take a closer look. Not only are the positions of the officers and the candidate interpretations of the mystical glyph, but so are their specific stations denoted in such a way as to allude to the physical representation of the glyph within the lodge room itself. As I have already mentioned, within the Kabbalah, the tree of life is said to reside within three columns or pillars represented by the three main officers of the lodge as such. The pillar of mercy represented by the junior warden. And that is this one right here. So this is the junior warden. Um, the pillar of severity, which is this one, represented by the senior warden. And then of course we have the pillar of balance, which is represented by the worshipful master. And if you look, the, uh, the tree of life resides on all three of these pillars, but the biggest chunk of it is right here in this pillar of mercy, governed by the governed by the uh, worshipful master in the east. These three pillars are further physically represented in every lawful and well governed lodge by the pillar of Jokin and the pillar of Boaz. So the the uh, the pillar J is the pillar of mercy, and the pillar B is the pillar of severity. And finally, the altar in the Book of the Law represents the pillar of balance. If any one of these three pillars be not present, then the lodge itself is no longer is no longer a lodge, just as if any one of these three officers that represent them is missing, then a quorum cannot be reached and a lodge cannot be opened. This is symbolical in the way that if a man has not the balance of all three of these pillars in his life, then his soul is not at peace and reintegration with his creator is but a fruitless hope. For within the lodge, as within ourselves, the three greatest pillars are those of faith, hope, and charity. For by faith, we endeavor to serve God in all our actions and in all our doings throughout the world. In faith, we will attain eternal life in heaven, and through hope, we fortify ourselves and know that this world of darkness and suffering is but transitory and not forever. Finally, by charity, we attain good works, and through those works, we achieve both happiness and peace of mind in the knowledge that we are doing our best to be fitted as perfect ashlars in that temple not made with hands eternal in the heavens.
If we lose any one of these three things, then despair and depotism rule our hearts and minds, and balance is overcome by severity and anger. By masonry, we learn to walk the balanced path and learn to subdue our passions and learn to grow and depart from naive mindedness to the true light and understanding. So might it be. All right, my brethren. So as you can see, uh, this was a very brief overview of the Kabbalah. Um, there are many more aspects of the Kabbalah that we find within the lodge itself. Um, but now I will go ahead and open it up for questions. And so if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you, Brother Roy. Sure. Any, any brother have any questions? Or comments, uh, anything like that whatsoever. All right, I'll start. Um, is this, it, uh, trying to find a way to word this, is this a paper that you wrote with all of the connections to the different lodge officers, or is this something that you found and you've added no, to I, No, I studied and wrote this myself. Okay, okay. Just, just to clarify, because yeah. it's, it's interesting how that, how you put them together. I, you did you did manage to use all three of the station officers more than once. Yes. I noticed that because it's like you got to the fourth one. I'm like, well, you've hit all the lodge officers. Where are you going to go from here? Yes. Um, you know, something that that is kind of fascinating when we start applying the Kabbalah to the Blue Lodge. And, uh, and I thought about this after I actually wrote the paper. Um, when you're sitting in the Blue Lodge, if you look at that glyph, in association with the Blue Lodge, you will notice that even the chairs that we sit in as officers uh, fit almost identical with the spheres on the on the uh, on that Kabbalistic tree glyph that I showed you. Um, there are, of course, a couple of chairs that don't quite fit, but uh, it lines up pretty well. Um, also because, you know, every man is trying to balance those spheres within himself. Um, naturally, you know, certain members of the lodge, uh, like those three officers, fit in multiple areas upon those spheres, of course. But yes, um, yeah, the, the three chief officers, you know, they seem to, in Kabbalah, when we're talking about the lodge, they uh, they definitely fit in more than one sphere, and they also represent multiple aspects of that kabbalistic tree. When I when I saw um, the the uh, what do you call it the sphere? You had another word you used the sephra. Sephra, yes. What is, what yeah. does sephra mean? Okay, so sephra basically means sphere. Uh, sphere. Singular, <laughs> yeah. Singular, it's sephiroth. Uh, when we're talking about multiples, it's sephra. Okay, S E F I R A. So when I saw the Sephra of Wisdom, my thought was, well, that's going to be the Master because the Master has. Because you also have the three pillars of Wisdom, Strength, and Beauty. You did mention that the six. Can you throw up the the graph of again? Of course. Either one of them. It's easier to see to talk about. Absolutely. Uh, just try to compare here. Um, okay, so Gabura is the Senior Warden, which is strength and then hokma which is on the other pillar is also the senior warden but it's representing wisdom exactly so it is exactly. Kind of, it's not as cut and dry like if you just ask me if you showed me these words and say well you know line them up with the officers my initial thought would be well wisdom strength and beauty so wisdom is going to be the master strength is going to be senior warden beauty's junior warden that's in the ritual over and over and over again exactly but it's a little more complex also what is the the purpose of the the little rainbow colors and then the four colors under malkuth okay so the four colors under malkuth um these correlate to uh astrological implications um and also you know the old uh the old hermetic thing of the of the elements so malkuth also represents earth Okay, and earth, of course, consists of earth, air, fire, water. So if we look here, we've got yellow for air. We've got fire, which is red. We've got this one right here is actually blue. So that's water. And this one is green. So that's earth. So earth is kind of fascinating because it composes all of the all of the five elements or four elements 
of earth, air, fire, and water. Um, it has to do with a lot of your alchemical aspects and your hermetic aspects of that. And then uh, Hokma, Hokma, the reason it's got this rainbow of effect is because it contains multitudes of different aspects of earth, air, fire, and water and different combinations of that when we speak about it alchemically. This oh, is kind wow. of an alchemical interpretation of the, of the tree of life. So that's that's part of the reason that it's kind of arranged this way as far as the colors. Okay. I'm going to take us back here. Very good. A any other questions? I, don't want, I want to make sure everybody else has a chance to make a comment or a question if they have one. I know it's nine o'clock in the morning and we're like in the middle of like, you know, or at least for me, it's nine o'clock in the morning and we're in the middle of like, oh my God, what is this? Yeah. Right. Well, this is good. I, I like this, uh, Roy, because honestly, I mean, I've heard anyone else who's been in the Scottish Rite um, has heard we talk of in the fourth degree, we talk about the Kabbalah and we show that mm -hmm. image of the tree of life. And then in the 32nd degree, we talk about balance where you are balanced between. And, and this is what is still hard for me to wrap my head around because if you say our masons good or evil you say well of course masons are good right we're opposed to evil but in the 32nd degree we say that your life is both good and evil and of course going back to the entered apprentice degree the checkerboard the the, the, the yes. checkered pavement of king solomon's temple the floor is black and white checkered with good and evil well the 32nd degree is and this is written down so i don't mind saying it um it balance is between mm -hmm. good and evil. And we are Masons are supposed to strive to find that balance between light and darkness. I guess maybe there's different interpretations of what they mean by evil necessarily, but it's like you're meant to find a balance, maybe a balance between reason and emotion or other things. Other, there are many conflicting forces in our lives. There are strong exactly. pillars at both ends we find the balance between the two so exactly i mean even when we even when we look at just the symbology of the uh, of even just the blue lodge you know and it's really fascinating that you bring up the scottish right because actually when i first joined uh blue lodge okay i became a scottish right mason I, I went you know we had short form prove up so i literally was entered apprentice to master in about a month you know, that doesn't leave much time for you to sit there and go, okay, what do all these symbols mean? You know, and then, you know, and then like the very next weekend after I was made a master mason, I was invited to a friendship dinner at the Scottish Rite. And lo and behold, you know, I was presented a petition and the very next weekend was a reunion and I went through oh, the reunion. My. So, you know, I mean, it was, if, if I had to do that part over again, I would say, oh, God, no, I'm going through, you know, my degrees first and then I'll wait a year and then I'll go into the other stuff. That is what we recommend. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But what was what what is fascinating for me, at least, was when I did go through the Scottish Rite degrees and, you know, there again, you're going through degrees very quickly at least in our jurisdiction, oh, us too. Um, you know, one weekend and, you know, you've gone from the fourth through 32nd and, you know, there's only a, you know, um, but what I did find really interesting was, yeah, I mean, that's the first time that I heard about the Kabbalah, you know, uh, as far as Masonically speaking, uh, was in the Scottish Rite degrees. You know, that was the first time that I heard about alchemy in association with Freemasonry within Freemasonry. Of course, you know, when you're on the outside of Freemasonry and, and if you're one of those esoteric minded people, you're like, oh, yeah, you guys are doing all kinds of alchemical stuff. But, you know, you bring that up in some of the blue lodges and, you know, some of the older members look at you like you've got three heads and they're like, what, what are you talking about? And what's wrong with exactly. you? You know? Um, and yeah, you know, and then, you know, when, when you're going through the blue lodge degrees, yeah, you know, I mean, we're presented that, that checkerboard and yeah, you know, that was something that struck me because it was like, wait a minute. I thought, you know, the purpose of this was we were all supposed to be, better than you know the people outside the lodge room you know um and you learn that you know yeah you definitely learn over time that yeah it's a balancing act you know um and when we look at the fact what what something that that struck me when i was writing this paper 
it's kind of fascinating that more of the Kabbalah isn't mentioned during the actual Blue Lodge degrees because none of the Blue Lodge takes place in the New Testament. All of the Blue Lodge degrees are pulling strictly from the Old Testament, strictly from the time of Solomon. And we know for from the Talmud that Solomon was very much a Kabbalistic-minded individual. He was a very esoteric uh, Jewish person. Um, you know, from everything from the way he built the temple or the way he, construct, he was told to construct the temple to even... Um, some of the symbology and stuff that that's attributed to Solomon. So I do find it, I did find it really interesting that, that once you pick apart the, the Blue Lodge degrees, you start to see this Jewish mysticism throughout it, but it's not blatantly obvious right there up front. Right. I, I do find it interesting. I will, I will, I will pick a nit with you. We do mention the book of Ruth. We do mention uh, Amos. Yes. There are, there are other, it's not exclusively, so I would say, yes, probably 75% of your biblical references are Solomon, but there are other parts. But you're oh, right, absolutely. we don't mention the New Testament, which is interesting because as I've gotten older and learned more about Masonry, I was always under the impression that Masonry has always been um, non-denominational in mm -hmm. the widest sense in that, you know, not, not just... You say non-denominational, most people think of different varieties of different sects of Christianity. But right. I mean, non-denominational as in Jewish, Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, whatever. But now I've come to learn that, especially in England, before the Grand Lodge was formed and even after, primarily you had to be a Christian to be a Mason. Yes. Yes. And so it's funny that our ritual could well have been written only by Jews, because they don't mention Jesus or the New Testament the slightest. Yeah. So whoever yeah. wrote it made it universal. In theory, it, and I don't know a lot about Islam, but in theory, everything that's mentioned in Masonry, a Jew would be familiar with that passage, a Christian would be familiar, and a Muslim would all be familiar. They all know who Abraham was and Isaac. Mm -hmm. They all know uh, the Book of Ruth, and they all know the um, King Solomon and his story of him. So it's like it masonry was written the ritual that we have was written to be inclusive but when masonry first really got started in england when it became more public and was more speculative it was only christians who were being let in exactly it until after the grand lodge was founded that they said well i think it was anderson or there was somebody who, who made the point of no we need to be more inclusive and bring more jewish brothers right and, and part of that i mean if we if we go back to the history of Freemasonry and, and especially in England, you know, something that we've got to remember is, is that at that time, the church and, and the Paul and, and the royalty were kind of at odds with each other. There was, there was some, there was some very definite uh, turmoil that was going on there. And when we look at Freemasonry from its beginning, it was, it was kind of a political movement to start out with in a lot of ways, or at least in some ways. And so I've always kind of thought that was interesting because, yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. In England, it was a very Christian overtone, you know, um, and, you know, it was it was for for church and God, you know, uh, uh, but very Christianized. Um, even when we look into some of the more esoteric sides of uh, the Swedish Rite and these various other uh, types of masonry that came together, uh, yes, Christianity was first and foremost. Even when we look at the Scottish Rite, uh, you could you could go up through the uh, about the the seventeenth degree, but uh, in order to progress past the eighteenth degree, you had to profess a Trinitarian uh, uh, Christian view, and it was only within fairly modern times that that was taken away. Um, but yes, you know. Uh, uh, I have been asked many times, you know, well, why is it that you don't allow atheists? You know, and we always give that answer. Well, because, you, you know, if you don't believe in God, you can't. There's no higher power that can hold you accountable for your for your actions. Um, but, you know, if we look at it from the Kabbalistic side of things, uh, it makes a lot more sense than just that you can't be held accountable for your actions, because in order to find that balance, you know, you're trying to align yourself with whatever that divine energy you believe in is, which for a lot of us is God. 
And if you don't believe in that, it makes it very hard to hold yourself in a balance because there's there's no repercussions either direction, not just from from your own personal uh, attributes, but there's nothing tugging at your heart, so to speak, that causes you to want to balance yourself. So I, you know. you, you, you inspired me as a, I always think of um, research topics. When I think of them, I make, make a point of stopping writing them down. I just thought of an idea for a paper of, you know, why Christianity and masonry? Because there are yes. so many examples of why it, it, are we Christian or are we not is another way to put it. Now online, of course, I mean, social media and primarily it's Facebook for me. I use Twitter a little bit. Primarily it's Facebook. Social media is is very useful and and absolutely horrible. It's a cesspool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but mm -hmm. it's, it's, um, there are brothers out there. And this is the thing that just personally I can't relate to. OK, I grew up in masonry here in Norfolk, Virginia, and I'm in Virginia Beach. But this Hampton Road is basically the Norfolk area. Everything centers around Granby Street, which is our main temple is. You had 10 lodges in that building. You had two Royal Arch chapters, a commandery and a Scottish Rite Valley, all in the same building, as well as Eastern Star and all three youth groups. But I grew up, as far as masonry is considered, I was very much aware that there was the Royal Arch. In Virginia, uh -huh. you got to get the past master's degree. And at one time, we strong-armed you and said, oh, you're senior deacon. You got to join Royal Arch this year because you need your past master's degree. And of course, there's the provisional lodge and there's ways around it, but it was very much a recruiting tool. Yep. Everyone in masonry in our area. And again, this goes back to my earlier thing I said about something you know about yourself that you assume everybody already can do or knows. To my mind, every Blue Lodge Mason knows there's the Royal Arch and then there's the, the Scottish Rite. And if you're a Christian, you can join the Royal Arch and then go on and join the commandery, but only if you're a Christian. Now, at the time, just to preface this for people who aren't familiar, the shrine until 20 years ago, you must be a command. You must have the Knight Templar, meaning you're oh, wow. Royal Arch Council in every state but Virginia and West Virginia where there's a council to Greece and commandery to join the shrine. Oh, wow. Scottish Rite or Scottish Rite, 32nd yeah. degree, then join the Shrine. The presumption, which I don't agree with, but that's how it was sold, is, well, in Masonry, we're all going to eventually be Shriners, and we're going to use one side or the other of that pyramid. Everybody's seen the paper placemat, which is a picture I put up everywhere, that's got the Royal Arch on this side, and the, mm -hmm. the, the York Rite on this side, the Royal Arch on this side, Shrine at the top. And then you have the blue, the first three steps of the the, the Master Mason, you know, mm -hmm. EA folk or Master Mason. So, and again, I've been around since 87. So I've seen how it's changed. A lot of younger Masons didn't realize this. Now you just join the Blue Lodge and you're in a shrine. Yeah. And some Shriders are constantly pushing to just get rid of the requirement altogether and just be shrine. No Masonic mm -hmm. tie. So... Everyone, again, I don't agree with it, but this is how it was sort of sold to us subliminally. If you're going to be a Shriner anyway, you join the Blue Lodge, you join the Scottish Rite, which is faster, or you join the Royal Arch and then the Commandery in Virginia, and then you can join the Shrine. So if you're a, a Jew, you're going to join the Scottish Rite. If yep. you want to get there faster... We have a three day, you know, we have a long weekend where you get the one day conferral and then you get the Scottish Rite, the obligatory five degrees. And on Sunday, you get the shrine ceremony and you're in the shrine in a weekend. So yeah. all of that mechanism was there. But I get everybody, to my mind, everybody knows there's the Royal Arch and there's the Scottish Rite. And everybody yeah. knows if you're a Christian, there's the commandery, but only for Christian Masons, but nowhere else. So nowhere does the commandery being Christian limit you from being, it doesn't make it alive. And in the blue lodge, you just have to believe in some Supreme being. Yeah. But online I'm running into brothers all the time who are shocked and appalled that the Knights Templar exists. And they say, I don't know if I can keep being a Mason because of this great <laughs> lie that this body exists over here. And that tarnishes me being a blue lodge Mason. I'm like, Time out, time out. How do you not know that when you join? And second of all, how is an appended body that you got to join two other things to get to possibly cast aspersions on the Blue Lodge 
being yeah. open to any Mason of any faith. Be a Blue Lodge Mason all day long. Yeah. No one's making you join the commandery. Exactly. It's not saying that we're forcing you to be a Christian. It's exactly. garbage. And people are saying that. I'm like, you're wrong. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. It's the wrong way to look. And you can always well, join the Scottish Rite. And you can always join the shrine directly. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so it's 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 a false statement that they're making that the commandery is somehow makes everything about masonry a lie because there happens to be this one body over here that you never have to join or see or have anything to do with, but somehow because they require you to be a Christian, I'm lying when I tell you joining the Blue Lodge, you know, or, or I can't believe that masonry in total would allow that to exist. And if yeah. we betray our basic principles by letting this other body exist. And I'm like, you don't have to join. Exactly. 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 I mean, it's it's really funny because, you know, in the 15 years that I've been in, I have seen our Grand Lodge here in Nebraska do some interesting things, such as the fact that our Grand Lodge has decided that Royal Order of Scotland is no longer in Amity. So in the state of Nebraska, even oh, though we have passed... Yeah, even though we have past Grand Masters that are all in Royal Order of Scotland, technically you can't be a member of the Royal Order of Scotland and be in Amity with our Grand Lodge. Okay, fine. What I really find interesting, though, is so when I joined Masonry uh, 15 years ago, I'll, I'll be honest, the whole reason I joined Masonry was because of Scottish Rite. In fact, when I was first looking into joining Masonry, I went to the Scottish Rite uh, Temple here in Omaha, and uh, walked up and said, hey, I want to join Masonry because I, you know, I want to join the Scottish Rite. And it was only then that they informed me. Now, mind you, this was especially dumb for me because I was a Malay. So, you know, I should have, you know, I, I have had more than one brother say, well, didn't you know this, that you had to join Blue Lodge first? And it's like, no, I just, you know, I, I didn't realize that they were two separate things. The, well, I'm sorry, the, what was that? Uh, Scottish Rite and Blue Lodge. Oh, okay. I, I was okay. not aware when I when I first was looking into Masonry that Blue Lodge and Scottish Rite were two separate things. I thought they were just the same organization. Oh, they were, oh that they were together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just assumed, you know, okay, well, you know, you you went to like Scottish Rite and you could just join. You know, I and, because, and go through because, all the degrees. Because Frank Land and um, I can't remember the other guy's name who wrote the ritual. Because they were both Scottish Rite Masons and it was the Scottish Rite 29th degree of uh, 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 crap, Knights of St. Andrew, which talked about Jacques de Molay, which is where they got de Molay exactly. from. Yeah, you would assume, well, all Masons are Scottish Rite Masons. Yeah, right? you know, so I was just like, yeah. And That's then, interesting. you know, of course, then the general, the general secretary tells me, oh, well, yeah, you need to go find a Blue Lodge first, and then you can join us. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, I would, well, okay, now that secretary messed up. I was like, well, you are welcome to come join Norview Lodge, which I am a member, and then we'll get you in here. Exactly. And By the way, I... That, there's a uh, uh, discussion in the chat. I want to make sure everybody hears sure. it. Go to Rourke. Uh, Rourke, I, I understand what you're saying. Okay. In the commandery, you must be a Christian to join the commandery. Yep. There are commanderies, maybe even grand commanderies, that don't want to follow that rule, that want to bend that rule and argue that technically you're only defending the Christian faith. No. On the petition, and the grand command, the uh, grand master of the commandery has spoken on this. Several of them have. You have to be a Christian to join the commandery. It's an organization for Christian masons. The fact yes. that some commanderies have let non-Christians join, they broke the rules. Now, I don't say you should kick anybody out who joined under false pretenses, but I'm sorry, that is not the official ruling of what the organization is. Some mm -hmm. brothers along the way have taken in themselves, like, well, it's not fair that we're exclusionary. And we should let people in who aren't Christians. They're wrong. They shouldn't have done it. <laughs> and, yeah. and and a lot of there are the, that's the same sort of argument discussion I've had online too. There will be a brother who comes along and says, what "Brother Ruark has said that." Well, that's not true. No, it is. I'm sorry. It, there may well be commanderies that say the wrong thing and say, "Nah, you don't have to be a Christian." You do. It's yep. on the dang petition. But anyway, that's. Um, there's, and by the way, we can get into a whole lengthy discussion uh, with what's going on with the commandery, but uh, and the the grand commandery. But I'd rather not because it is kind of yes. negative and a lot of bad blood has happened. But anyway, uh, but going back to my original thing about Christianity, though, it's it's interesting how we had the Swedish right. We had a good brother talk to us about the Swedish right 
um, two years ago or two weeks ago, two meetings ago, and he explained about the Swedish right. The Swedish right, you must be a Christian to join. Which is very interesting, and you must be a, you must continue to be a Christian. Yes, to join. Yes, and there are other appended bodies, especially with England, and I think it deserves a whole paper in itself when we talk about the particular things about England. Because I have some brothers say there's a Scottish right in England, and some say there isn't. There are like several things that you could argue are Scottish right. In yes, they call them. There's the ancient and accepted right. And there's, it's kind of funny how England does things just a little bit differently from America. I'm they much do. more familiar, of course, with American independent bodies. It wasn't until a few years back that I realized that the Scottish right in many parts of the world is a, a truly independent right. You get the first yes. three degrees in the Scottish right, and yes. it's a separate right. In America, it's not a separate right. It's an independent body. And they're not allowed to give the first three degrees. You must join a Blue Lodge and maintain membership in a Blue Lodge. So, uh, but there are other plenty of bodies out there. Most of them are offshoots of the Knights Templar or something. So, if if it's a body off of the Knights Templar and you have to be in the Knights Templar and you have to be a Christian during the Templar, so I don't know if that really counts. If there's a research body off of Commandery, but there are other separate bodies out there off of Royal Arch and out, right off the Blue Lodge. Yes. That require you to be a Christian. And, There's a and, number of them. And I have yet to find an appendant body in Masonry or a rite of Masonry that requires you to be Jewish or Muslim or any other religion. It's only Christianity where there's any kind of restriction. Yes. And but it's interesting can, how that's grown up. It right. is. It is. Right. And if I, if, I, if I can just address, I, I did see uh, Brother Ruart. Um, actually, uh, yes, depending on uh, your Grand Master. Now, see, our Grand Lodge in Nebraska, uh, they do, uh, and the Grand Master supports this, one does have to be a Christian to join Knights Templar. And I mean, they mean that perfectly clear. In fact, uh, I myself, I applied for membership uh, to the Knights Templar. Now, because even though I am a Christian and I fully, fully acknowledge I'm a Christian, um, because I am a Mason, Eastern Orthodoxy considers me a non-person and they made me choose and they excommunicated me because I chose Masonry uh, for various reasons. Um, Because of that, when the Knights Templar did my investigation, they found out that I had been excommunicated from my church and they made no bones about blackballing me from joining Knights Templar because I was not an active member of my church. Didn't, oh, wow. matter, that, didn't matter that I said I, w- I was a Trinitarian Christian. Didn't right. matter that I, that, I, uh, that I recited the Nicene Creed, that, you know, what have you, uh, it still was not enough. Um, so... Yes, there are varying degrees uh, with as as, uh, as our, our our brother uh, Christopher said, uh, depending on what state you're in and that sort of thing. Uh, but I know for Nebraska's sake, yes, if it, it is not just a matter of you have to uh, uh, defend Christianity uh, in in the state of Nebraska, you have to be a Trinitarian Christian and and uh, and and. A church-going Trinitarian Christian. That's interesting. Uh, you have to show that you're an active member of a church. Wow. Yes. yes. And by the way, and, and, and deference to Brother Ruark, and I'd rather you actually join the chat rather rather than chat in the chat window. I'd prefer it if you actually we we can talk. But I don't know if you mean Grandmaster. This is where it gets confusing. The person in charge of the Grand Commandery in America is the Grandmaster. Whereas yes. the Grand Master of individual Blue Lodge, Grand, Grand Lodges is Grand Master. So I don't know what, what he quite meant by that. I uh, presumed he meant the new Grand Master of Commandery, the new set of Commandery. Um, well, that's a whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> because, uh, well, okay, for this, I, I will summarize, but I hate Aaron Dirty Laundry, but anybody who pays attention is aware of this. We recently removed. In, and I'm a member of Grice Commandery. I'm not active in the Commandery, but I am a member, and now I'm now on the Grand Commandery's IT committee. So I'll be involved in some level at that. <laughs> I haven't been active. I, I got my life membership in uh, in um, in Commandery and Royal Arch and Blue Lodge all at the same time. And foolish me, I didn't bother to buy my Scottish Rite Life membership back in '95, and I really wish I had today because I 
keep putting it off and now it's expensive. But I joined the commandery, became a life member and haven't been back. It's just, I haven't had time to attend. So if I wasn't a life member, I probably would have admitted, but I do, you know, I, I, I'm still a member of the commander. I still read the books they send me and all, but there was an issue which came up it invo involving this other Masonic body that does not require you to be in the commandery or even the Royal Arch, I think, to join. But because they consider themselves the equivalent of commandery, it gets kind of messy. And I can't even, get, I, I've still tried to get a straight answer on that. But basically, some people were member of this other group. And because the current Grand Master of the Grand, of the no, wait, what is it? The Supreme? What is it called? Mm -hmm. The American body is the Supreme yeah. Grand Commander. Yeah. Uh, term, right? Grand Commander is at the, at the state level. Yeah. So it's the Supreme Grand Commander. Somebody help me out here. I can't think of what it's called. Not sure. I mean, no offhand. Okay. Anyway. Uh, Chris, are yeah. you thinking about Grand Encampment? Grand Encampment. Thank you. Yes. The Grand okay. Encampment is the nationwide i don't even know if it's in other countries all of america all of the you all of the american grand all of the american grand commanderies are at the state level and the elected grand commander just like we elect a grand high priest and a grand master there is the grand encampment which is in charge of all commanderies in america there is also the general grand chapter of the royal arch there is no masonic body above the state level above the grand lodge anyway the Grand Master of the Grand Encampment, there's all kinds of stuff where basically he, he fired the deputy, I forget what his title is, he suspended a bunch of people, he declared that if you're a member of this other Masonic body, which is like Knight Masons, I can't remember the exact name of it, but basically if you're a member of that group, you can't be in the commandery. So there's a whole big stink. And on top of that, to settle this question, which is out there about, do you have to be a Christian to be a member of the commandery? They went overboard at grand session or whatever it's called, where basically they said, you must be a Trinitarian Christian. You must be believing these 10 things to be a, a commander, to be in the commandery. And it's like, okay, I'm a Christian. I joined the commander. I'm a Christian. I was a member of a Lutheran church at the time. I'm a Methodist now. That was good enough. They didn't care. They didn't ask if I was active. It's like, I'm a Christian. They don't care. They didn't delve into my faith. In order to resolve an issue, which apparently Brother Ruark and I have his disagreement here, what, do you have to be a Christian or not? I say clearly yes. He says no. In order to fix that problem, these guys went way overboard and basically said, you have to believe in the Nicene Creed and you have to believe in this. And they basically meant you have to be a fundamentalist Trinitarian Christian. I mean, it was so strict in what they said qualified to be in the commandery. Probably half the members of the commandery would no longer be members. So they went way overboard. And everybody, myself included, like, well, time out. That's too far. Well, that resolution failed, thankfully. But the Grand Master did so many things that set people against him. There was a special session of the grand encampment three months after the regular session and it's every three years that they elect a grand master he serves for three years and they basically threw him out of office and reinstated the deputy and um now the deputy is the grand master and it was just it was so far over what it reminded me of what went on in south carolina like two a year or so ago for some reason masons on the world stage who have the most visibility out there are doing very, in my opinion, very stupid, very unmasonic, very unbrotherly things to other Masons in the name of whatever cause they support. And I think it's just, me, it's just abhorrent. They should not be acting this way. We should be, especially if you're that high profile in Masonry, that people who are non-Masons are aware of you because you're in charge of a very big organization, you shouldn't be doing these things and you shouldn't be doing them in public. And all you're doing is tarnishing our reputation and it's all petty and it's all personal. And it's all just, it just offends me greatly to have to sit and listen to that. And it's like, it just makes us look bad and you shouldn't be acting. I wouldn't tolerate it if the master of my lodge did these things. 
I would go to him. I would stand up in lodge and say, I'm sorry, but I have to say, worshipful, what you're doing is not being brotherly and not being Masonic, and you're not bringing us together as brothers. I need you to, to reconsider your actions because you're tarnishing us with what you're doing. I wouldn't be afraid to stand up in lodge and say it. And that's in my lodge where nobody else in the world would hear about it. This is happening on the world stage. Mm -hmm. And it's multiple places. It is multiple places. And I'm just like, I'm just bothered by it. It's like, what is it? Guys, you're not that important. I'm sorry. We let you have that job. Anyone else could come along and do that job. You're not so damn special. I'm sorry. Uh, it, It just, it's a very bad trend. And because of social media, things that we probably never would have heard about. And it would have been in some letter that would have been sent to my local commandery and this, this recorder would have read it. And I never even would have heard about it because of social media. I hear about it and everybody else hears about it. And it just gives us all a black eye. Well, so, you know, I'm, <laughs> and I'm, 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 I'm offended. Well, you know, and I, I'm kind of reminded of uh, something that, you know, that uh, my worshipful master said here a while back. And, uh, you know, he said, so many Masons, uh, you know, anymore, uh, they take these officer positions and it's not all of them, but there's a few, uh, and they take these officer positions and they, they somehow think that that elevates them above the rest of, of yes, their yes. brother. Yes. And, and the first thing we're taught uh, as entered apprentice Masons is what do we always end our lodge meetings with? How do we meet on the level? Yep. Meaning that no Mason is any better than any other Mason. If you've got grand before your, your title, that, that just means that you are, that you are, are, are a speaking voice for the rest of us, brethren, companions, knights, et cetera, ad nauseum. Um, it doesn't mean that you're above anyone. And I, I think I think in the day and age that we're in, and I've seen this trend coming for a while, you know, it's kind of that old adage of you get a prize and you get a prize and hey, you get a prize. Um, You know, there's this mentality now that I've seen where title is everything. You know, we have we even have some Masons that join join Lodge and and they join the appendant bodies, not because they necessarily want to be members or necessarily want to be active in them, but so they can have the dues card to show to people. And uh, and I think when we have those type of Masons and then they get progressed to these higher offices, if you will, uh, they kind of take those offices the same way sometimes. You know, I mean. Uh, it, it's always been kind of funny to me. You look at some of these Masonic bodies and uh, being a member of the different uh, research lodges that I'm in, I, I, I look at different appendant bodies all the time. And it's so funny when you look at the roster of grand officers, because a lot of times those grand officers are grand officers in this appendant body. And oh, look, they're in this appendant body. And oh, look, they're in this appendant body. Yep. And, and they're grand in all of those bodies. And it's like, okay, wait a minute. You know, you're all you're all the same names. What? Wait, what? <laughs> you know, you're, you're just um, speaking titles. Yeah, I exactly. Agree. Exactly. And at that point, then then bringing back to what I was reading earlier, you become unbalanced. You know, because at that point, you're forgetting what what those first lessons were that were inculcated, and you think yourself higher uh, than what you actually are. And, you know, and, and that's what the blue lodge tries to teach us is that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, uh, the only person that's really that high on a pedestal is the architect of the universe. The rest of us are just the workmen and we're just trying to better ourselves and everybody else around us. And I think that's what we, I, I think if more of us focused on that, I think a lot of these, uh, little petty skirmishes and, and ego trips would, would, would fall away, but that's just my opinion. Thank you. Um, good way to wrap it up. I, I did want to say one thing, and you're a, you're a fellow DMLA, something, there, there are often things that I hear in the DMLA ritual that I wish we included in the Blue Lodge ritual. During the installation ceremony, we say to the incoming master counselor, who's the presiding officer, from the ranks you have arisen and to the ranks, you will soon return. And I think the Blue Lodge should add that line. Because too many Masons forget it. I'm a past master twice over. 
I'm going to be pass, I'm going to be master of research lodge in a couple of years, and hopefully I'll I'll do better there. Uh, but it just I'm just you know, hey, people call me worshipful. It's like okay, hey, worshipful, hey, how you doing? All right, I'm just I, I'm a I'm a worker bee. I'm down in the trenches. I'm working. I don't mm-hmm. consider myself better than anybody else for being foolish enough to let them put me in line twice. I just <laughs> I'm nope. sorry. Most of the time, it's like honestly, many lodges I've been in. It's like, okay, well, let's see. Keith's already been. Uh, Roy, Roy, we're going to make you junior deacon. And then uh, uh, Merv, okay, Merv's going to go in. Next year, Merv will be junior deacon. And then Brian, well, yeah, well, okay, we'll eventually let Brian get back in unless some new guy comes in. It's just everyone in the lodge gets to be master if the lodge is small enough. So you really shouldn't take yourself too seriously and think you're that damn important if you look around and say, hey, Everybody else who got initiated, got to be junior deacon within a year, and got to be master of the lodge. Don't take it as a compliment. I'm sorry. It is hard work, and if mm-hmm. you get that job, you should work hard and, and live up to the title, but don't think you're so damn important because we let you have that title. More often yeah, than yeah. not, it's we needed I, I got tired of recycling Keith five times as worshipful master, so we had to put somebody else in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's like the worshipful master of my lodge says, you know, um, you know, if, if you think you're, you know, if you want to be master and you want to be master alone, it doesn't work out so well because if you turn out being a tyrannical master, yeah. it doesn't do you any good. If all your lodge members are gone, then you're, then you're exactly. standing up there alone. You know? by yourself. So. Um, I did want to go and announce um, we did have uh, last week, we had our, our in-person stated meeting, which is, Quite a, quite a change from our unstated meetings we're doing here. Uh, Brother uh, Wes Latchford, uh, who's a recent, in fact, we, we, we voted on his petition and then we let him give the talk. So I said, well, when they're getting ready to vote on his affiliation, it's like, um, I really hope you don't say no because uh, I'm gonna have to go find another speaker pretty quick tonight. <laughs> but he gave a great talk on the Tyler Sword. I really enjoyed that. I think we all really enjoyed that. But that was last week. So now we're back on schedule every two weeks with these unstated meetings. On June 11th will be Brother Dan Huffman, who's a member of A. Douglas Smith Lodge Research, and he will be speaking on conspiracy theories. So that should be most interesting. And then Brother Parvez Tarani, who spoke in February, uh, had an interesting talk about um, uh, about the church, I can't remember, the, the, the Chester Cathedral. Um, he will be speaking on the Manitoba Legislative Building, a sacred temple at the heart of North America. It's a Canadian government building that has a lot of Masonic symbols that the architects put all over it. And I think because we he had it as a slide in his Chartres, Chartres Cathedral presentation that he wrote a whole nother paper based on just that. So that'll be interesting. That'll be on the 25th. So we do have some interesting stuff coming up. We, I got people booked out to May, June, and July here, which is good. So we have we have speakers coming up. Um, I want to get Brother Andy Martinez back in here and give a talk. He talked at our lodge in February, and he said he'd come back to give a Zoom meeting. So we do have more fun stuff coming up. Appreciate Brother Bradburn coming out and joining us. And I uh, appreciate the brothers. We had a couple of brothers join and then left again. I didn't even get to say hi. Ah, they, they joined late. But this will all be on YouTube. If you're watching us on YouTube, please uh, like and subscribe. It lets us know we're doing a good job here, and I hope you – uh, you managed to sit through 90 minutes of this. I don't know how many people watch all of the videos, but um, they're, they're generally about an hour and a half, two hours long. So, uh, but I appreciate all the support and thank you all for, for sticking out. We had people that had to drop off. It's good to have you all here. Any brother, anything to offer before we uh, close out? I just would like to thank everybody and uh, it's been fun and, have a great weekend, guys. Yes, and, and I hope that you you come back as an attendee now that you've spoken. I mean, so we have speakers come and we never see them again. It's like you're welcome to come and just attend, and you, you're more than welcome. Uh, I like Thank to you. build up the attendance. We had 14 people at one point today, which is pretty good for us. Yeah, so sure. I like to build up the attendance if I can. I'm not sure how, but tell your friends, uh, bring them with you. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, but good to have you all here. Uh, our, our, uh, Brother Rooster, our worship master, is not doing well. Uh, he was not able to attend today. He actually missed the meeting. Uh, our senior warden might hope to be here, but we have our secretary. So good to see you, Keith. If you want to say hi or say goodbye before we yeah, go. I just wanted to say one thing. 
as a Mason, like when I was a younger Mason, we had a past grandmaster, A. Douglas Smith Jr. You know who I'm talking about. He was instrumental in starting Virginia Research Lodge, but he always said that the most important title in Freemasonry is brother, and that has always made an impression on me. Amen. All right. That's a good way to end it. Thank you all for attending. We'll see you all again soon.